<laughs> Welcome to podcast number 30. I am Sage Man, CEO of... <laughs> I couldn't even finish that sentence. I am so not a CEO. But I do have like seven people who do artistic things for me when I pay them large lumps of money that I acquire by working at a diner. So that's kind of like a CEO. Uh, for those of you just joining us, well, uh, this is not a bad time to jump on. Uh, the usual first two segments of the podcast, the companion segment and the Team Salmon segment, are hereby discontinued unless there's something to talk about regarding them, but there's no shortage of topics in the other three segments. And the first segment is the new fanfiction segment. Uh, last week I talked about my first fanfic, The Good Life, a very embarrassing Monsters vs. Aliens fanfic, which I wrote ten years ago. Well, that fig launched an entire six-part story when I decided to make it a crossover with uh, Twilight. So, uh, yeah, the first story in that series, although where one story ends and another begins was, in retrospect, utterly arbitrary, is called Monsters vs. Vampires, and has 22 chapters, and an interesting feature about this series is that every chapter is told from first-person perspective by a different character. Uh, that's kind of cool. Chapter 1, Wake Up Call, narrated by Bella. It's been two years since the end of Breaking Dawn, and Bella and Edward are on Isle Esme for some reason. And uh, when Alice appears, Bella and Edward have apparently been on the island for so long that they're completely unaware that there was an alien invasion recently that was thwarted by monsters. But now Alice reports that they're coming to determine if vampires pose a threat to humans. That is, the monsters are coming. Uh, Alice has prepared a slideshow explaining the backstories of the five monsters, the sort of thing that wasn't in the movie, but was explained on the official Monsters vs. Aliens website, so yay, I did research. The monsters arrive on Isle Esme, and immediately, since the trio of vampires are glittering in the sunlight, it's pretty clear they found their quarry, you know, doesn't glittery doesn't equal vampire, but it means something, right? Uh, the Cullens quickly explain that if any human receives confirmation of the existence of vampires, the Volturi will reign bloody vengeance. Also explain that their family does not harm humans. The monsters demand to know where to find the vampires who do feed on humans, but the Cullens refuse on the grounds that the monsters can't exterminate an entire race of immortals, and the two groups decide there's a lot they need to talk about. Chapter 2, Introductions, narrated by Dr. Cockroach. Edward explains the basics of Twilight Vampire lore. His mind-reading capabilities are tested. He takes a moment to read Bob's mind, and it, it takes him a while to find anything. That, that's a good one. You know, that, that's a pretty good joke. Good one past me. Uh, you know, good joke that's only possible in this particular crossover. Good on you. In return, Dr. Cockroach gives some further background on the monsters for the benefit of Bella. Uh, uh, for some reason, it's only taken this long for the monsters to agree that they will not reveal the vampires to any human. Strictly monster knowledge, as Bella puts it. So, uh, yeah, that happened way too early, but that's the status quo I'm setting up. The Cullens and the monsters have knowledge of each other. Link and Edward exchange cell numbers just in case they ever need each other. <laughs> Am I going to sniffle at the end of every chapter? Okay, um, chapter 3, Threats, is narrated by Jacob, who turns out to have been on the island with Edward, Bella, and Renesme the whole time, who... It's established on the verge of puberty, what with her accelerated growth and all. You know, I used to accept all that at face value. It, it's weird how ridiculous and, and kind of creepy it sounds now. So, Jacob is brought up to speed on the previous day's events, and Alice has a vision of the Volturi wanting now to terminate the Modesto monsters to safeguard the secret. There's a line about how the Volturi still aren't the bad guys, because in the dialogue in Twilight said as much, I believed it, even despite the evidence to the contrary. I, I'm on the spectrum, okay? I, I believe things people say... And I'm not good at extrapolating or analyzing. So Jane and Alec turn up at Isle Esme and interrogate the Cullens about the risk posed to vampire secrecy. They determine that Bob cannot be trusted with the secret and plan to destroy him. Edward calls Link to warn him. Uh, Edward, Alice, Bella, and Jacob aren't sure they should stick their necks out to defend the monsters, but Renesmee wants to. So they do. Because Twilight. Chapter 4, Romance, is narrated by Susan. She and Dr. Cockroach are going to Los Angeles for their first date. Susan rambles a lot in her first-person narration. It's, it's, it's not badly done. I, I kind of dig it. The date zips by. Susan falls madly in love with Dr. Cockroach, just like that. And they run home to try and make out, only to find that their size difference makes the experience less than pleasurable. So Dr. Cockroach resolves to build a Susan-sized sex robot to gratify her physical needs. So there's that. Chapter 5, The First Assault, is narrated by Link. 
uh, he and Bob are filming a commercial to raise awareness for global warming, which I suppose is a callback to that really, really bad inconvenient truth joke that Will Arnett ad-libbed and the hacks at DreamWorks decided to actually put in the movie. Uh, the two of them drive home in Link's Lamborghini Diablo, because that's a bitch in car, and it's explained that Insecto is at Yellowstone, and Susan and Doc are working on their robot, so I guess it's been some time since the previous chapter. Anyway, they're driving back from filming the commercial when Jane shows up to kill Bob. She can't do any harm to him, because indestructible gelatinous mass. Yeah. There's a fight scene that's not too bad, except there's a moment where Link punches Jane and it actually does damage. I don't think that is actually possible, because Twilight vampires are super OP, and it's been established in this very story that Link is a natural creature, and therefore way below the power level of the other monsters. I think I may have accidentally nerfed Twilight vampires, because they can't go as fast or jump as high, and they're not quite as strong. I, I guess at this point I hadn't noticed how insanely overpowered they are, and subconsciously scaled them back to a reasonable level, so that uh, Link, in particular, could operate on their level. Anyway, the fight ends with Jane imprisoned inside Bob's body. Link calls Edward, who promises that he and the rest of the Cullens will be at the monster's home shortly to figure out how to deal with the problem. Chapter 6, Defense, is narrated by Carlisle for some reason. The Cullens arrive at the mansion in Modesto. Bella shields them all from Jane's powers, and Jane, exasperated, returns to Volterra to report her defeat to her bosses. The monsters decide to throw the Cullens a wild party in repayment for their help. There are two consecutive halfway decent jokes here. Uh, Link asks, You guys remember what happened last time we had a party? Because I don't. That's, that's a decent partying joke. And Dr. Cockroach rep replies, Ugh. Really gotta start editing these. Okay, Dr. Cockroach replies, I seem to recall that I woke up playing saxophone in a church in Nigeria, and that's the last thing I remember before I was brought back to my senses by being run over by a chariot in Newark. That's some pretty good, random, absurdist humor. The, this story really isn't very good, but I'm getting more genuine enjoyment out of it than I did from the first part of it, and more than I thought I would, for sure. My overall writing quality is subpar, but the moments and the jokes are really solid. Chapter 7, Convention, is narrated by Maximum Ride. I couldn't resist anymore. I threw in the cast of the third thing that had inspired me that year. Uh, Maximum Ride is a series of novels about six mutant children with wings. I don't know if it had any cultural impact. It, it had a movie adaptation, but I didn't find out about the adaptation until two years after it came out, so all signs point to the whole franchise being forgotten. But ten years ago, it was kind of a big deal, and Twilight and Maximum Ride was an immensely popular topic for crossover fanfics. So the fourth and uh, then most current Maximum Ride book ended with the six kids, known collectively as the Flock, flying off for some unknown mission given to them by the voice in Max's head. The fifth book ended up not revealing what that mission was, but in this fanfic it led them to the party that the monsters and the Cullens are having in Modesto. The Flock recognized the Modesto monsters and vice versa, as both have done very public saving the world stuff by this point. Link invites the bird kids to participate in what's basically become a monster convention, and carelessly outs the vampires to them. Reluctantly, Max and the rest of the flock join the party, where Fang flirts with her because this was at the point in the series where they weren't together yet, but he was often trying to get together. Chapter 8, Good Times, narrated by Jacob, whose first thought is to say what an honor it is to be the first character to narrate two chapters. <laughs> That's awesome. Good old Jake being kind of meta. Uh, so he's playing Wii Music, which I shill because it's a generally poorly received game that I greatly enjoyed. Uh, he, Link, and Iggy hang out a bit. Link decides that in late December they're going to throw the first annual monster convention, and he starts planning it. It's a pretty solid chapter, atmosphere-wise. There, there's no plot whatsoever to this story yet, but it's fun to read. There's some good gags. I am enjoying myself. Chapter 9, The Love Machine, narrated by Susan. Dr. Cockroach has finished building the sex robot, and he starts piloting it, but Susan gets serious Uncanny Valley vibes from it and can't deal with it. They decide they'll have to find another solution, uh, and they share a kiss that's not as awkward as their last one. Chapter 10, Invitation, narrated by Nudge. That's interesting that the second Maximum Ride character to get narration in is Nudge. Well, she was always my favorite, and uh, I certainly do capture the way she'd write. Pat on the back from me to me there. Anyway, the flock are flying around when an old man on a jetpack pursues them. They're understandably paranoid about that sort of thing, but it turns out to be General Monger, giving them invitations to the monster convention, which will be held at the old Cullen home in Forks. And that's the whole chapter. Guess I just wanted an excuse to have Nudge narrate as soon as possible. 
Chapter 10, Peace Offering, is narrated by Galaxar. Galaxar, after the destruction of his spaceship in the movie, is confined to a wheelchair and is the lone prisoner in the facility that used to house the monsters. Link shows up to offer him an invitation to the monster convention, with the ulterior motive of asking if he could once again extract the Quantonium from Susan's system, so as she and Dr. Cockroach can be together properly, and Galaxar confesses a lack of knowledge on how to recreate his racist technology, and a lack of interest in helping the beings who defeated him. Link departs, and Galaxar, unless I'm mistaken, is never seen or mentioned again, so I'm not sure where I was going with the fact that he survived the movie, much less that the monsters had an interest in forgiving him, which they really shouldn't. Ultimately, didn't go anywhere. So I think that'll be enough of that for today. I'll see you next week for the second half of Monsters vs. Vampires. This week in Droon, it's special edition number three, Voyagers of the Silver Sand. The back cover tagline is... A missing staircase, an enchanted caravan, the secret to Droon's future lies in its past. Long dramatic pause to reveal the book's cover. Yo. Uh, okay, um, I remember from last time this book being, uh, pretty, 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 pretty good. Yeah, yeah, they're memorable, more, more memorable than most of the books in the latter half of the series, which I only read once, so I don't really remember all that clearly. Let's dive into it. Chapter 1, The Hidden Stairs. Uh, we get a recap of what's going on in Droon in the midst of an action scene as the heroes flee from the beasts. Eric has a vision of what he initially thinks is the Darklands, but soon realizes it's actually the ruins of his own town. Gethwing is sharing the vision with him and taunts him. Zello, Relna, and Khan arrive as reinforcements and have a message from Bodo and Vasa, who know how to restore the Rainbow Stairs. Chapter 2, City Out of the Clouds. Riding a bunch of mini Pasha carpets to Kalahar Valley, where they meet with City of Ro. Boto and Vaza explain that when Ko cursed the stairs, a creature called Saba stole five treasures from the Tower of Memory. The Guardians don't know what the treasures are, for Galen gifted them in a box mere hours before he disappeared in Ut. But Quill once wrote a legend of the five treasures. If the kids and Max go back in time, they can collect the five treasures from five different versions of Galen and bring them back to the present. However, Saba is capable of transcending time and space. He's a phantom version of Ko, which allows Ko to be in two places at once, and will surely pursue them into the past. Chapter 3, Deserts of the Past. Uh, the kids and Max are joined by Quill, who has been given a voice, as they travel by desert caravan into the past. They dress for the desert in robes and turbans and st such to protect them from the sun, even though I'm pretty sure it's nighttime for almost the whole book. Uh, this marks the first occasion that Neil calls himself Zabalak the Genie King. That'll be significant later. They are given a 15-hour deadline to collect the treasure and ride off into the past on some blue pilkas. And I just realized this is the vision Zara showed Eric back in Book 17. Nice. Their first stop is Tortu, or rather the small settlement that will become Tortu, for they're far enough in the past that only a small handful of buildings have been erected on the colossal tortoise's back. Their destination, a palace shaped like Gethwing's head, where a teen Galen has been captured. Chapter 4, The Dragon's Dune of Night. Thinking Gethwing's palace likely to be impenetrable, they get into it by having Julie shapeshift into a beast and bring the rest in as prisoners. In the palace, they overhear past Gethwing talking to his assistant, Bleg, about plans to use Spar to overthrow Ko and become Emperor Gethwing. Eric and Quill theorize that this is the plan that Gethwing is still working on in the present. Saba appears, and Gethwing mistakes him for Ko, making it all too easy for Saba to gain access to this time period's treasure. Saba spots Eric and chases him. Chapter 5, The First Wizard. Eric is rescued by his friends, who have also rescued young Galen. The first treasure, the Talos, is in the palace's kitchen. Neil provides a distraction, and the others collect the Talos, a pair of twisted spectacles. They escape Saba and the beasts of the past, and enter their next story, where they are immediately captured by a band of nins. Chapter 6, Song of the Nins. As the nin nins march their prisoners to their city of tents, Quill estimates, based on the look of Tortu in the distance, that they are at a point in time about 100 years after their first visit, right around the time when Ko first entered his magical slumber. The kids and Max are tied up in a tent, but are freed by a little nin girl named Thesha and her baby groggle, Minky. Accompanied by Thesha, they search for the treasure. There, they encounter a young Lord Spar. Not kid Spar young, but younger than the Spar they know. This turns out to be the moment Spar announced Ko's disappearance, took control over the Nin armies, and dubbed himself Lord Spar. The heroes spot Saba making a beeline for Spar's newly constructed palace and know that the second treasure must be there. Fisha summons Minky's mother, and the heroes ride the Grockle to the palace. Chapter 7, The Luck of the Voyagers. Spar realizes he's being pursued and attacks. The heroes escape and find a young Galen frozen in stone. 
Eric can somehow read the inscription at the base of the Galen statue and frees him. Galen fights Spar, and the kids go deeper into the palace as Saba draws ever closer. At Spar's workshop, they find the newly constructed three powers, so they consider destroying them, but realize this would alter the future, so they don't. Instead, they encourage Galen to shapeshift them and scatter them to the winds, as they know he did in their past. Saba comes upon them, and they realize that the rain stick Thesha gave them must be the second treasure after all. As young Galen holds off Saba, the heroes flee. Chapter 8, The Rat-Faced Snitchers of Zoop In the next time period, the kids encounter the Knights of Silversnow, who have been called upon by Galen to find a group of thieves called the Rat-Faced Snitchers of Zoop. They spy on the Snitchers at an oasis. The Snitchers have stolen the greatest treasure of Max's race, the Gizzleberry Seed, a magical seed that can be used to grow every variety of Gizzleberry. Max intervenes before the Snitchers can destroy the seed, and they rescue a young Galen, once again escaping Saba just in time. Their next destination seems to be nowhere until Tor 2 approaches. Chapter 9, The Domed City The kids reminisce about their last time in Tor 2, and as they explore the city, they realize it is their last time in Tor 2. They've been taken to the exact moment they visited the city back in Book 13. Galen finds them and sends a Saba-like phantom to talk to most of the party while he has a private word with Eric, assuring the boy that he can do impossible things if he follows his heart or some malarkey like that. I don't know. It didn't strike me as especially helpful. The important information is that Galen can do Ko's phantom trick, which he explains Ko stole from Zara, and that all the sons of Zara are capable of. Galen and Eric rejoin the others, and Galen retrieves the fourth treasure, a blue stone called the River Dragon, from within a fountain in Tor 2. The kids take the magic caravan to the final story. Chapter 10, Midnight on the Silver Sand. When they arrive, Saba is already there, as is Ko. They realize they've come back in time to before Galen ever set foot in Drune. Ko and Saba are staring at the sky, and Eric, on a hunch, uses the Talos to discern that Galen is in the upper world, trying to find the right place to create the Rainbow Stairs at this very moment. As Saba spots the group and attacks, Kia fights back while Eric astral projects into the upper world. Chapter 11, Wonderful Things. Eric meets with young Galen and helps him find the exact spot where he should create the stairs, then returns to his body. Eric wonders if the reason the five treasures are so vital is because they get used here and now to make sure Ko doesn't take control of the stairs. So they use them and the rainbow stairs are created, too strong for Ko to wrest control of them using his black disc thingy. Ko and Saba are defeated and Eric picks up the fifth and final treasure, a petal fallen from the wand of Uruk. They ride back to the present, finding that the city of Ro is in an aerial dogfight with Ko's flying fortress. Chapter 12, Beyond the Clouds. A legion of Zorfendorf archers, accompanied by Queen Relna's magic, successfully repel Ko's fortress. They bring the first four treasures back to the Tower of Memory, while the fifth, the petal, is used to restore the Rainbow Stairs. Our heroes, including Khan and the King and Queen, ascend the stairs, ready to face Gethwing in the Upper World. So this book was really fun and epic. Going back in time for a bunch of continuity callbacks and gathering treasures kind of reminds me of Avengers Endgame, except it's happening about two-thirds into the overall story instead of as the finale. Not that Endgame will be by any stretch the last film of the MCU, but you know what I mean. It's kind of a finale. So adaptation. Let's uh, discuss the depiction of the five Galens met in this episode. The teen version of the first stop should be played by the no-beard actor, who also plays Kid Spar. Surely by this point in the series, the actors will have a better time with teen characters than with the pre-teen roles they'll be stuck with for six years, eh? The older one in the second story, me. Snitcher's story, still me. In the Tortu time period, they finally find the Tony Abbott version of Galen, who I guess is in this season after all. I still don't remember if this is his only appearance in the season, but regardless, I think we'll keep him in the opening credits. The fifth Galen is the 12-year-old Nobeard once again. The young Spar encountered in the second story should be played by me, just with a younger-sounding voice than I use for normal Spar, so I was wrong when I assumed that there wouldn't be any scenes in the whole series where Galen and Spar are played by the same actor. I I'd be fighting myself in this scene. Although, yeah, as I say this, I'm thinking, maybe he should be Kid Spar in that scene? I'm not sure. New characters in this episode, well... Quill's been given a voice. While described as an annoying, squeaky voice by the Guardians, I, for some reason, imagined Craig Ferguson's voice, so there we go. For Bleg, D. Bradley Baker, because at this point I had read the Drune Encyclopedia on the Scholastic website, and the detailed entry on Bleg led me to believe that the character would be much more important than he actually ended up being. He's only in this one book and doesn't do a damn thing, but meh, helps me fill a quota of amazing voice actors. Saba, being an exact duplicate of Ko, should of course also be voiced by Ron Perlman. 
For Thesha, my live action plan for the character was to search for a young Raven Simone type. The animated plan was to go with voice actress Sally Safiati. Finally, I think the leader of the Snitchers deserves a cameo by someone. Let's go with that legendary nerd of nerds, Eddie Deason. Incidentally, it's my personal headcanon that Shago is of the same race as the Snitchers, being a rat faced thief himself. Possibly intentional on the part of the author, but never said outright. That's how I depict it in the adaptation. And today in Keys and Kingdoms, it is now 1980. I do so love the 80s, though they weren't an especially good time for Disney. Bronze Age and all that. Today we're watching The Watcher in the Woods. Uh, as I understand it, Disney's one and only horror film. Another film I would not have heard of nor considered for the list had it not been included on Doug Walker's Disney Sember. Listen, I support hashtag change the channel with all my heart. Really, I do, but I'm not going to pretend, as so many do, that Doug Walker's never been anything but a hack. The nostalgia critic used to have value, and many better critics would never have gotten their start without him. The channel went south, abused and neglected all of its non-Doug creators, and has no value anymore, but let's not pretend it never did. You know, so separate the art from the artist. You know, the, the fact is... Bill Cosby is a beloved comedian, James Woods is incredibly entertaining, Vic Mignona and Todd Habercorn are brilliant voice actors. The fact that they're all terrible, rapey people doesn't change that. I allow myself to enjoy their work, even as I condemn them as people, and sincerely hope that they don't get any more work ever again. And, you know, Doug Walker's worst crime is being kind of oblivious, so I allow myself to occasionally enjoy a good NC editorial. Anyway, The Watcher in the Woods. Let's see what that's about. A quick IMDB search. The only involved name I recognize is that of Betty Davis, who I've only heard of because there's a song about a woman who has her eyes. Uh, and I just realized that I accidentally bought the 2017 remake instead of the 1980 original. I did not know the 2017 remake was a thing. Uh, the 1980 original doesn't seem to be available for purchase anywhere. Hmm. Fortunately, someone appears to have recently uploaded the entire movie to YouTube about a month ago, so I'll watch that. And yet, when Bob Show posts a perfectly legal review of a Disney movie, it gets taken down instantaneously. YouTube, man. So, our opening credits alternate between cheerful music box tunes and... God, I'm stumbling all over my tongue today. Ugh. <clears throat> what was I saying? Our opening credits alternate between cheerful music box tunes and a genuinely scary soundtrack. I'm digging the atmosphere. So, uh, let's see, there's a family searching for a house, uh, they find a secluded house out in the woods, and there's a POV shot watches their car pass by, the POV of the titular watcher in the woods, I suppose, whatever that may be. The family has two daughters, one teen and one not quite teen, I'm guessing the teen will be our protagonist. The realtor talks with the owner of the house, played by Betty Davis, who's very shifty and suspicious, and that's our setup. I don't feel much like synopsizing this particular film. You know, I, 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 th I think I'll just stick to the important stuff. Um, the acting and cinematography are very cheesy and ADZ, but the, the horror atmosphere is quite effective. Um, I'm taking atmospheric notes, you know. I guess. So, so glass shatters in the presence of the Watcher, the old lady talks to it, the protagonist can't see her reflection in a mirror, there's flashes of blue light. Uh, you know, by the time I was a little over 25 minutes in, my theory was that the Watcher is the homeowner's deceased daughter who wants to kill and replace our protagonist, Jan. I uh, will not disclose whether or not my theory was right. It's a, it's a twisty horror film. I, I think you should watch it yourself to find out the secrets. With luck, it'll still be free on YouTube, or maybe it'll be on Disney+. Plus. I still don't know how comprehensive the Disney Plus library will be, just that they'll be removing the crows from Dumbo. How the heck are they going to do that? They're kind of plot relevant. So yeah, not going to give a single detail about any of the film's plot points or sequences much too twisty. I will say this, the ending is very sudden. I expected some kind of resolution, but no, it's climax, and then fade to black and credits roll. It's, it's a happy ending, it's just not so much of an ending as it is a stopping point. So yeah, that's all I gotta say about The Watcher in the Woods. Uh, I recommend it, it was good. So that's it for part one of the Bronze Age. I went and bought all the movies for part two of the Bronze Age. Let's hope I didn't accidentally sneak any remakes in there like, like this one. Uh, so now let's recap what I learned about Keys and Kingdoms from that first third. Uh, the Aristocats, I want to borrow its elements of geography and travel. Bed knobs and broomsticks, lots of details. You know, sulfuric motorcycle, other magical vehicles. A bed of transportation as a magic item. Uh, natives do not equal uplifted animals. You know, I, I knew that already, but it helps to solidify it and make it canon. 
Uh, a native must resemble an air-breathing vertebrate, but maybe merfolk can talk to more creatures, like cephalopods and crustaceans, and whole armies of animated objects, perhaps brought to life by a star-shaped amulet. Robin Hood? I thought maybe natives work under a caste system, with uh, species equaling social role. The natives work very much like the Faunus from Ruby. I gave all natives an unarmed piercing attack to represent biting or horns, and Mishkas and Circes are very welcome in native communities, less fringe than in human communities. The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh, uh, books with worlds inside, plushy constructs resistant to bludgeoning damage and made to entertain the children of wizards and the super rich. There are elephant and dire weasel variants that are actually dangerous. Some bounce. Gotta openly use some Disney imagery. I mean, uh, the, these plushy constructs definitely qualify, but the other things, like Pooh's clay pots of honey. And think of blustery day and rainy day disasters. The rescuers, uh, Mishka society, should always parallel that of the local humans, and they keep to the sidelines. Also pirate treasure in the bayou. Pete's dragon. Invisibility should be a staple of dragon spellcasters. Uh, the many uses of dragon parts, and from there, the medicinal properties of all magical creatures. Potioneering and the collection of components needs to be a huge part of KK magic. Sailing plots, amnesia plots. The black hole. Black holes, naturally. Psionics. Robots and droids. Characters who speak almost entirely in quotations and proverbs. Meteor storms, airlock breaches, and the resultant frostiness. And from the Watcher in the Woods, the atmospheric horror elements I mentioned earlier, culty rituals on eclipses, also dirt bike races. And uh, yeah, what the Watcher turns out to be and where it's from, I gotta think about that. And you know, unrelated to any of the films I watched in this chunk, I started thinking about the K&K &K multiverse, because that's for sure a thing. And okay, that's the end of another podcast. Y you know, I had planned to refrain from planning for the future of Tapas until July, but I caved, and I started making those plans yesterday, 12 days before July began. Hey, I held out for a long while, so we got some plans going on. I'd best get to those.